Let's talk about non-spontaneous nuclear reactions. I've spent some time in prior videos talking about various spontaneous nuclear processes that are occurring because we have unstable nuclei that are trying to get to a more stable state. But sometimes we can force this to happen, uh, and this would be a non-spontaneous process, right? Something that normally wouldn't happen that we are causing to happen. And we do that by bombarding a nucleus uh, with other smaller nuclear particles or other smaller nuclei and we bombard the nucleus and it splits things apart and when it splits things apart then it changes that element from one thing into another and that change is called transmutation remember the term mutation just means to change something and trans means across in latin so we're going across from one thing to another we're changing from one thing into another through a bombardment process. Um, that's the technical definition. I think that transmutation is often used in a lot of different contexts. Anytime you have a nuclear process where you're going from one into another, changing from one element into another, um, which the alchemists would have been stoked about, right? The alchemists were all about turning base metals into gold. And now we're saying, well, you, you could potentially do that, right? Transmutation. Okay, let's visualize this. There's a scientist by the name of Niels Bohr. I always like to call him a chemist, even though he's definitely more of a physicist. I always claim all of the physicists as chemists, um, and they probably do the same to us. Um, one of the other chemists that we'll talk about later, Ernest Rutherford, famously said that it's all physics, the rest is just stamp collecting. And I just, I sort of buy into that, even as a chemist. Okay, so Niels Bohr is famous for the Bohr model of the atom. He's really involved in a lot of, um, a lot of, physics and chemistry, dealing with electrons and the movement of subatomic particles and their energies and quantum mechanics. Um, but he also came up with what is called the liquid drop model. And the liquid drop model models fission, and it models fission from a bombardment kind of perspective. So we'll call that non-spontaneous nuclear fission, as opposed to spontaneous fission, which can also happen. You can do it without a bombardment process. But Bohr says, well, what if I take a little neutron here? Here's my neutron. And I shoot it at a nucleus, right? So here's my big nucleus, and I have a tiny neutron. So obviously not to scale here, uh, but, you know, we'll go from it there. Um, he visualized a nucleus like a water droplet, that's hence the liquid drop model, or it's sometimes called the liquid droplet model. I like to think of it as a drop of water on waxed paper, right? Have you ever played around with that, where you could put that droplet and you kind of move the wax paper around and it kind of rolls around on there? So our droplet's sort of the same way. Now I shoot something at my droplet of water, and now that neutron is going to start to push its way through this droplet. Right? And it's still moving. If I accelerate it with enough speed, it's going to keep moving on, pushing further through my droplet, pushing further through my droplet, until we have very little droplet left. And then we're going to end up with kind of two halves to my nucleus. Right? I started with one, now I have two smaller and my neutron kind of goes through unfazed. All right, that's the, the model, the liquid droplet model there. Now, when we split into two smaller nuclei, I needed more neutrons in the larger one to kind of pack everything in and balance out the charges because I have so many protons in there, I have to be able to space them out in the appropriate way. But when I get to two smaller nuclei, then I just don't need that many neutrons anymore. So some of the neutrons come off are knocked off in this process. So I have kind of the original one and I have these others that come off and now these others can go on and split other nuclei and then they shoot off more neutrons and then these can shoot off more neutrons and, and split more nuclei and split more nuclei and this is called a chain reaction. So that chain reaction is where we have kind of one process. I started it with one neutron and I just ting right there at the neutron it started this process and now this process is going to continue and magnify like the Greek hydra where if you cut off one head then three grow in its place 
So it's that kind of idea. And this chain reaction is where we get all the energy from fission, right? So we can harness this energy, this movement, and the splitting apart of all these um, nuclei, and we can use it to power things. And that's, uh, that's where nuclear fission kind of gives us our power or gives us power for various countries that utilize it in that way. All right, so that's Niels Bohr and kind of the liquid draw model. This is the idea with transmutation. So I started with something with a certain amount of protons here. Maybe it's uranium with 92 protons. Now I have two smaller things that are probably not exact perfect halves of it, but a split to more stable configurations. And of course, this thing is going to split in such a way to where we have two lower energy halves compared to what I started with. So that's that transmutation. Now, you can do this process with other types of particles. So they could be nuclear particles, they could be nuclei themselves. So let's think about um, bashing a nucleus with an alpha particle, for example. So an alpha particle, as a reminder, is a helium nucleus, which means that I have two protons and two neutrons. So if I take an alpha particle and I shoot it at something else, then I'm going to cause things to split apart, to mess around. This is kind of a big nucleus going into two smaller halves. But if I have a big particle like this, this could just cause things to get knocked off of other nuclei. So let's take a smaller nucleus, actually. Let's take nitrogen. Nitrogen-14 is a pretty common isotope of nitrogen. It's fairly stable. If I take that stable nucleus and I shoot an alpha particle at it, so I'm bombarding it with this alpha particle, then what ends up happening is I knock a proton off. And I can kind of notate proton as just my hydrogen. I can notate it as a P with one and one. You'll see it multiple ways, multiple notations, but they mean the same thing. So this is a proton. In the same way that in chemistry we think of an H plus ion as a proton, there's a couple different ways we can visualize that. So if I knock a proton off of something, then how many protons do I have left over? I have 14 plus 4 gives me 18 nucleons total. 7 plus 2 gives me 9 protons total. So I must have to have 8 protons and then 17 nucleons. So if I look at my periodic table, then what has 8 protons? That's oxygen. Now this is actually one of the ways that um, Ernest Rutherford discovered alpha particles, discovered protons. So the isolation of the proton came about um, and Ernest Rutherford is credited for it. So Ernest Rutherford, Rutherford, with his gold foil experiment, he used gold as kind of the, the thing that he was bombarding. He bombarded it with, these are my alpha particles. And then he was essentially knocking protons off of the gold. And he could measure the movement of those protons. He could measure kind of how these particles deflected off of the gold foil experiment. So that's kind of Ernest Rutherford and how he ended up discovering the proton. He's the one who said that um, that he everything's physics. The rest is just stamp collecting. Another famous one-liner that he has, he had a whole bunch of them. He was, he was a New Zealander, um, kind of a cool, interesting chemist. I definitely take credit for him. Uh, he's definitely the chemistry side of things. But he also said that he was so surprised by this reaction. He was so surprised by the particles deflecting back that these particles were coming off of it, that it was as if he had shot a gun at a piece of tissue paper and the bullet deflected back at him, which I think is a cool visual. All right, so that's Rutherford. This is also the way that neutrons were discovered. So, um, kind of the lesser known James Chadwick discovered neutrons. So let's look at a reaction here. If I have beryllium, let's do beryllium nine. And if I bombard it with an alpha particle, so here's my helium nucleus. So I'm bombarding it with the alpha particle. Um, what they found is that if you bombard the right thing with alpha particles, then uh, something that's neutrally charged can be deflected off. And then what's left over is carbon-12. 
which is a very stabilized type of carbon, right? So I take this guy, and then I bash him with this, and then I look at the particle that comes off. I find that it doesn't have a charge. It's the same mass as a proton, but it doesn't have the same charge. So I've discovered something new. So James Chadwick actually is the first one who isolated the neutron. Which is just kind of interesting. And that was in the 1930s. So kind of we're in the year 2020 right now. So we're still within 100 years of that time frame getting discovered, the new neutron getting discovered. So this is what's happening in particle accelerators. This is what we're doing here at like CERN and the Large Hadron Collider and places where we have these kilometers long arms where we're accelerating things and bashing, bombarding particles into each other and then measuring the stuff that comes off of them because what comes off of them is interesting and these products then, these fission products, we can use to determine kind of what was happening here with our nucleus and kind of give us some indication of that. Now the energy of these reactions is usually measured in a unit called electron volts. So while volts measure, measure potential, this is a measure of energy. So at the particle level, you'll often see things in electron volts. And the relationship between electron volts and our SI unit of joules is one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th, which if you know anything about the charge on an electron, uh, that might be a familiar number. So this is the relationship here between joules and electron volts, which is kind of an important one because we as chemists tend to think about the energy that comes off in kilojoules or joules. And uh, physicists tend to think about it in electron volts, so this is our communication tool here. All right, so um, this is just a little bit about non-spontaneous nuclear processes. This gives you an indication of how they work and how we balance them. It's the same type that we've seen with spontaneous, except that we are usually adding something to the reactant side as opposed to just splitting things spontaneously into products on the product side. So anytime we have a smaller particle or a smaller nucleus on this side, that usually is going to indicate a bombardment reaction, one of these non-spontaneous nuclear processes that will follow that liquid drop model. All right, uh, if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, have a great day.